In this demonstration, we will run a lightweight version of the full model, which only covers Germany and a month worth of weather data, just to make it calculate very quickly. And we will start from scratch, basically. Um, I have already navigated to a folder where I want our tutorial to be located. And um, first I need to clone the pipes are your repository. Luckily, I have already um, typed this quite a few times, so I can uh, use the auto completion, but basically you git clone the pipes are repository. And this might take a few seconds, but not too long. The repository is about 20 megabytes large. And then we go to the pipes are your directory. See, very neatly, it's a Git repository, so you can also, um, when working with it and making changes, you can easily track the changes. And um, we can have a look at the directory. So um, there's um, a couple of config files, there's documentation, there's um, scripts and the snake file, which you see right here. Uh, which we have, uh, which implements the whole workflow. And in the scripts folder, there's the, um, the folders, um, the, the, the scripts, um, which the snake file executes. And in data, we will store um, our data bundle. And the thing we have to worry about the most for now is the environment.yaml because we don't have the environment yet and we need to install all the packages which are necessary to execute the pipes IUR workflow. So if we have a, a quick peek at the environment.yaml file, um, you see, um, and if you are roughly familiar but not completely familiar with the um, uh, style of Condor environments, um, we give it a name, pipes are UR, and we uh, withdraw the packages from uh, different channels. Um, most of these rely on the ConderForge channel, but um, for example, SnakeMake lies in the Bioconda um, <coughs> channel. <clears throat> and then we list uh, quite a few dependencies, which you can uh, go through in a quiet hour. Um, but what I want to show at the end is that in addition to using Conda, we can also install um, packages via pip within Conda. So if we want to do it now, we would have to run Conda and create um, this environment.yaml and press enter. And that would install the environment. I will not do this now because I have already installed the environment because it might take some time. Um, so I can safely skip to the next step and activate the environment. And what does not ship with the environment is the solvers. So since we are running a very small tutorial example, we can rely on uh, open source solvers um, for which we need, um, for example, ipopt and coin CBC if you're working on Linux. If you're working on Windows, um, coin CBC doesn't package um, for in Conda for Windows. Uh, in this case, you can use GLPK, which is an alternative open source server, but here we prefer to use um, CoinCBC. Um, we need two solvers because CBC only handles linear problems and IPOpt can handle nonlinear problems. Why do we need non non to solve nonlinear problems? Well, the actual big optimization problem is linear. So CBC fully su suffices. 
But um, the clustering, the k-means clustering, solves a nonlinear optimization problem. So this is why we also need access to a nonlinear solver. If you are using Gurobi or CLP, uh, uh, Cplex, um, these will also these will uh, su suffice as well. Um, they will also be able to run uh, quadratic problems. Um, I will also skip this step because I've already done that. I can show you that I already have coin CVC and IP opt in the environment. And we're and if that all works for you, then we're done um, having installed the dependencies of package software package dependencies of pipes at UR. Next thing we worry about is the config.yaml. Um, as you've seen on the top, I will also display this again. Um, there are two um, config.yamls uh, shipped with the main repository, which is config.default.yaml, which you should use if you run the bigger problems. But there's also a config.tutorial.yaml, which we will now use. Which, um, yeah, which will run a more lightweight variant, which you can use completely on your local computer, and it will run within five minutes. So, um, but we need to we need to copy this uh, tutorial.yaml to our actual config.yaml. Um, as you see above, there is no config.yaml in here yet. So we create this by copying this config.tutorial.yaml and um, we can have a look at the config.yaml now. So this is a lot to take in and I would also advise you to look at this in a quiet hour. Um, maybe I'll just highlight um, two rows here as we look at Germany only. Um, and also we just have uh, a month, namely March of 2013 as an input data, uh, as opposed to a full year, which we normally sh choose. And other than that, this configuration file goes on and on and on and on. And as I said, look at it in a quiet hour. Um, we are interested now in, um, hypothetically, what would a snake make run if we would solve a simple network. So what we would do is we run snake make and we need to provide the number of cores um, that we want to provide this snake make and we want to create a particular file, namely results networks like S6, um, there it is. I, I will use the auto completion for my convenience. If you type it for the first time, um, it will be a little bit more work. But basically here we do all the uh, configuration settings. We want to aggregate to 24 hours. We have a CO2 emission reduction target and we want to aggregate to six nodes. And this LC opt here means that we want um, optimal line expansion. So sometimes, um, sometimes it might make sense to check first uh, what hypothetically would be run before actually running it. And we can use this dry run with the minus n flag, uh, which will now show us all the rules um, that would have to be run to create uh, this file. And so you see quite a lot of rules and some of these rules will, will sound familiar or look familiar if you've followed the tutorial. Um, so there's this electricity rule, there's the base network rule, um, there's build renewable profiles rule, there's some clustering and also there's the retrieve data bundle rules which have to rerun. And also um, there's a solve network rule that 
would be run. If you, um, so now that's the, that's a very broad overview. And um, if you want some more detailed view and we will not go into detail, um, then you, there's, there's a display of um, each rule which takes a set of inputs. So here it lists all the inputs of the data bundle, uh, the outputs of the retrieving the data bundle. And um, let's take another example, um, the build renewable profiles. So this will take, for example, the base network um, the natural protection areas and the offshore shapes as well as uh, the weather data and we'll create the profiles and store that in an intermediate file. What is interesting maybe here is that um, there's an extensive uh, logging provided with um, SnakeMake and PipesAUR so you can always later look at the logs of these rules and maybe debug an error. And also you can define resources. So if you know what resources um, your uh, rule will likely or maximum require, then you can define it here, which makes executing it on a cluster um, and doing the resource allocation more efficient. So here, build bus regions, for example, is a very, um, yeah, is not very computationally intensive. So you just need a gigabyte of RAM and building the renewable profiles um, might take up to 20 gigabytes. So now is the time that we actually run the workflow. And I keep my fingers crossed that this will run through. Otherwise, I'll just do a re-recording of this section. I have skipped a few minutes ahead and let's assume we have successfully solved the network. And we now want to analyze this network. An easy way to do this is with Jupyter Notebooks. And I've already prepared a few code snippets, but we'll fill it in together. So um, follow along. The first thing that we have to do is we have to load the pipes and network. And actually, we will not look at the uh, tutorial, small tutorial network, but a slightly larger network with um, 200 nodes and a two hourly temporal resolution. This takes a moment, but very soon we want to get a first glimpse of this model and we can uh, see a small map of the network um, just to see that it covers the whole of Europe and um, has the 200 nodes that we expect can also have a look at um, how many other components there are. So there are 200 buses. Um, there are 347 lines. Um, there's 48 lines. And each node has a load time series. There are 686 different generators and 593 different storage units. If we want to check the temporal resolution, we can look at the first 10, for example, we can see that here, we start in 2013, the uh, 1st of January at 12 o'clock, and go in, in two hour steps further. And um, if we want to look at the length of this, then we see we have 4380 of these. So next we can look at all the different um, components. So here we have quite a few lines um, and we also have generators 
with their attributes in a pandas data frame we have the storage units with their static component in a data frame and we also have um, the loads for example but here's no data in here well that's oh, that, there's very little data in here so there's um, no p set so no power set point um, this is because the loads are mostly time dependent data if you want to look at time dependent data we can look at the time dependent data frame for the um, power set point so if we look at this we can see that here we have the time series plus uh, an identifier for each of the nodes and here's the power demand in megawatts we can um, aggregate this along the columns so that we get an aggregated time series for the whole system and plot this in a line chart so we have to adjust the size a little bit so that consider it's visible um, but here you see um, the time series so what else uh, could interest us in terms of time varying component data it could be um, the capacity factors of the renewable generators this is stored in p max per unit so the per unit capacity factor of the generators and if we look at this data frame sorry this is obviously a time dependent value um, you can see it looks very similar to the load we have an identifier for each of the generators and each row represents one snapshot so the problem here is we have um, yeah, merged data for onshore wind, solar, runoff river, and um, offshore wind. Um, we want to filter a little bit. For example, we could look at a particular time period. So for example, July of 2013. And a particular location in Italy, for example, for solar. And we can plot this. And again, we have a different, slightly different size. And let's look at this. We can see very neatly the daily patterns. And if we do that for um, an onshore wind location in Spain for a period of July to maybe let's see we can do uh, to September and plot this you can see a much less regular pattern okay so this is so far data that is input data so the loads time series is input data the availability of onshore wind and solar and all the other renewable generators um, is input data but we have already solved the network so we should be able to see what the system costs and this shows us the objective value in billion euros per year and this is 190 billion euros per year you can also look at the transmission expansion of individual lines so we take the um, optimized capacity of the line and look at um, compare it to its original capacity 
and let's just look at the first five entries here. You see that line one was, for example, um, reinforced by 4.5 gigawatts. In addition to the transmission line expansion, we are also interested in the generator and storage capacities, and we uh, want to look at it aggregated by carrier. So we can look at the generators and group them by the carrier and want to look at the optimal capacities and aggregate them all together. And because the base unit in pipe size is megawatts, but we want to see it in gigawatts, we divide by a thousand and see here, for example, that we have um, 313 gigawatts of onshore wind in the whole European system can do the same with the storage units. So I sneak, sneakily copy it and replace generators by storage units. And, uh, there's a typo here. Storage units and we see that we also have 125 gigawatts of hydrogen storage. Note here that we couple energy and power capacity of um, of the storage technologies uh, by a max hours parameter, which tells us how much time a generator, a storage unit could charge or discharge at full capacity. Mm. So next bit, we want to look at maybe the um, energy storage over time. So also the storage units have time dependent values and we want to look at the state of charge over time. And let's start by looking at the whole system. And we might want to resample that to a daily resolution. So we see the um, super daily uh, patterns and uh, we take the average and we want this in terawatt hours and then plot it. So here you see for the whole year, uh, we, we start by discharging quite a lot in, in winter and then charging up um, during the summer months before um, slightly withdrawing again in autumn. Now we can um, also distinguish this by um, different storage technologies. So say we want to look at the batteries. How do the batteries behave in the system? So we again, we look at the state of charge and let's maybe just look at a uh, limited period of time and we want to filter this for everything that has to do with batteries uh, along the uh, columns because the um, yeah the column uh, the rows are for time and the columns are for the storage units and then we want to aggregate all the storage the battery storage units together and display this again in units of terawatt hours so plot sorry So here you see a very neat daily cycling of the battery storage. Uh, it's a lot different than the pattern that we have seen for all the storage units. So one could think that if we look at a different carrier, so for example, hydrogen, maybe uh, we revert to the full year, then we already see much more seasonal patterns. That's still not 
quite the same as we've seen above. So we can also look at um, uh, hydro storage, which we also have in the system. And you will see that uh, this comes very close to the pattern um, that is the aggregate because it's also a very high volume of storage capacity compared to hydrogen and battery storage. The last thing I wanted to show is that you can also very nicely plot uh, these networks. Um, we need another package for that, this Cartopy, which uh, handles projections and uh, can uh, plot the base layer of the map. And let's say we want the, there's some function uh, where we can calculate the line loading and we want to display the line loading. And I've prepared some code and um, this is the output that we want to create. And we see here that there's a particularly loaded line here between Denmark and Germany, uh, less loading here in Portugal, uh, and so on. And the line width uh, represents the line capacity in this case. And you can see that here that um, we have the line width according to the optimal capacity and the line colors according to the loading. Um, we can put that, uh, use a, a color map for that. And we can also, uh, which I quite like, uh, change the projection. So um, if you want to, an autographic projection instead, um, this will result in a different, uh, uh, yeah, a different projection of the, of the map. Um, or if you fancy another one, as a final touch, uh, we can use the Mercator projection. Which doesn't look quite as nice um, for my personal taste. And that's where I will leave you. And I thank you for watching this tutorial. And I hope it is helpful for getting you started with Pipes that you are.